it is my pleasure to introduce Ian Rowe. Mr. Rowe is a senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, where he focuses on education and upward mobility, family formation, and adoption. He's also the co-founder of Vertex Partnership Academies, a new network of character-based international baccalaureate high schools opening in the Bronx in 2022. He's also the chairman of, the, of uh, Spence Chapin, a nonprofit adoption services organization and the co-founder of the National Summer School Initiative. He's been widely published in the popular press, including the New York Post, the Wall Street Journal and the Washington Examiner, and is the author of an upcoming book tentatively titled Agency due out next year, which seeks to inspire young people of all races to build strong families and become masters of their own destiny. He is also, I believe, the only think tank scholar in DC who has won multiple Emmys for his work at MTV. Ian, take it away. Well, Chris, thank you very much for that long uh, bio. Oh my gosh. Well, uh, so good to uh, see uh, everyone. I've uh, been looking very much uh, forward to this conversation today, not only because of the opportunity to discuss uh, 1776 Unites, but also, be, also because we get to speak to the rising generation. So welcome to all of the college students that are viewing. You know, our hope uh, today is that this discussion can actually be helpful to you. You know, as Chris just mentioned, you know, we know that you're trying to make sense of the world that you are inheriting. Uh, and our hope is that this discussion can help you uh, maybe most importantly, help you decide what principles do you want to embrace to improve the world that you're inheriting? You know, as Chris said, it is safe to say that our country is going through a national reckoning, not only on issues of race, but class, gender, uh, sexuality, but often this reckoning seems to be one-sided. That unless, you know, you subscribe to a certain orthodoxy, your point of view might be canceled, dismissed. And this trend seems to be particularly uh, present on college campuses. You know, it's this worldview that posits that America is not actually a land of opportunity, but rather a land of oppression, that anti-Black racism is literally embedded in the DNA of the country, that the, the country's founding principles themselves were false, quote, when they were written, if you listen to the New York Times 1619 project, that if there's a disparity in any uh, outcome uh, by race, then there's only one explanation. It must be uh, the cause of that disparity must be racism. And as a result, this ideology kind of posits that there's essentially no change in the conditions of black people uh, uh, since the worst days of slavery. So that's kind of a dominant narrative that we think is out there. And you know, today I'm very pleased to be joined by three panelists, all phenomenal in their own right, who I think will provide uh, an alternative, an empowering alternative. And we're, we're really, frankly, looking forward to discussing uh, these ideas with you. So I wanna to get to the Q&A. But the three panelists, and please uh, uh, turn on your uh, video as I announce you. First, we have uh, Dr. Will Riley, who's a professor of political science at Kentucky State University. Uh, Dr. Riley is uh, awesome in many, uh, many contexts. He holds a PhD in political science. He's authored some great books, uh, including Hate Crime Hoax and Taboo. And, and Dr. Riley, I love when you, you, you simplify things by just sharing data. Um, that seeks to often debunk uh, compelling narratives or narratives that are out there but are, that are, are not that compelling, especially after you share your data. Um, we're also joined by just Janice Rogers Brown, who served as a US uh, circuit judge of the US Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia. And before that, Associate Justice of the California Supreme Court. Uh, really honored to have you, uh, Judge Brown. Thank you for joining us. Um, and finally, uh, Dr. Glenn Lowry, uh, who's an economist, uh, professor, author, uh, you know, many accolades throughout his career, you know, at the age of 33, Dr. Lowry was the first African American tenured professor of economics in the history of Harvard University. He's the Merton P. Stoltz Professor of the Social, Social Sciences and Professor of Economics 
at Brown University. So welcome, welcome uh, Dr. Lowry, Dr. Riley, Judge Brown, thank you. Um, and you know, full confession, we are all part of this initiative called 1776 Unites, which defines itself as a movement to liberate tens of millions of Americans by helping them become agents of their own uplift by embracing the true founding values of our country. And you know, it's led by primarily black activists, educators, scholars. We acknowledge that racial discrimination exists and we are all working towards diminishing it. But I think these words are important. And, and Glenn, uh, Dr. Lowry, I'll, I'll go to you first um, and then Judge Brown and then Dr. Riley. But I think these words are important. 1776 unites dissents from contemporary group think, group think and rhetoric about race, class, and American history that defames our national heritage, divides our people, and instills helplessness among those who already hold within themselves the grit and resilience to better their lot in life. So Dr. Lowry, I'd love to start with you about what compelled you to get involved in 1776 Unites in the first place? And why, why is this an important initiative that, that, that this voice is being represented now? Well, two things. There was a push and a pull. The push was the distaste that I felt in reaction to the initiative at the New York Times, the 1619 Project, to recenter the national narrative around the, the fact of African enslavement, a fact without any question, a momentous fact to be sure, a morally disturbing uh, sequence of events, but not the defining central narrative of our country. So there was the push, but there was also the pull of Robert Woodson, uh, the great leader of the Woodson Center who uh, inaugurated this initiative uh, and with whom I've been working off and on for decades uh, to further the uh, mission of, uh, of the Woodson Center. Uh, I wanted to be involved because Bob was uh, leading the effort. I mean, let me just say why I found so distasteful the tone of the 1619 Project at the New York Times. Uh, there's no denying that slavery had a huge impact on the shaping of the American Republic coming out of the 18th century. But there is also no denying that the founding of the United States of America, uh, I'm talking about the Civil War, I mean, I'm sorry, the Revolutionary War, and I'm talking about the, uh, the uh, uh, ratification of the Constitution was a world historic event. It was an advance forward for freedom. It created the context within which emancipation could ultimately be realized. It is the foundation on which we stand. And we Black Americans are quite privileged people. We're, we're not the victims of systemic racism of a racist white supremacist country. We're rather the privileged recipients of the opportunities that the freedom established by the founding of the country has made possible. We're the richest people of African descent on the planet by far. We can determine our own futures. So I wanted a vehicle for voicing my own mild outrage uh, at what was afoot at the New York Times, as well as solidarity with what Bob Woodson was trying to do, which is bring some people around the tables to speak out in a coherent and articulate way against it. Thank you. Uh, Judge Brown, I'd love to hear your thoughts. What, what, you know, what, and I know you've joined a little bit later, but what compelled you to become part of this initiative? Well, uh, Bob Woodson, who is uh, very much part of the moving spirit of 1776 Unites, likes to tell this anecdote about Martin Luther talking to the artist who was going to paint his portrait and saying to him, um, you know, basically, don't make me handsome, paint me warts and all. Uh, and so that idea, uh, and, and uh, Bob often says this, is we know that America is not perfect. Uh, we know that uh, no human institution is perfect. The only way to have a perfect country is to have one with no people in it. So uh, <laughs> that's never going to happen. Uh, but, the, but the reality is that uh, the, the that it has now been um, 
positive is one that looks at America as uniquely, irretrievably uh, racist, bad, um, that, that has an entirely negative history. And that, of course, uh, is simply not true. And so what drew me to this was one, the, the idea that we might um, talk about this in a way that accepts that the bad part was really bad. Slavery was, um, you know, a very serious wound, um, but also that the founding of this country was something marvelous, miraculous. It was um, something new in the history of the world, as Glenn said. It was the first time, the first country um, that focused on self-government and the ability of people to determine their own destiny. So that seemed very worth defending. Uh, I also found myself appalled and um, very distressed to see the kinds of things that were happening in the country, the erasure of our history, um, uh, being uh, told uh, that all of these things that have happened that, that are part of who we are um, and what we've experienced um, should be made to disappear because some people had decided um, that that was not a history that, that they could embrace. So all of those things uh, made me think that it was important um, for us to try to balance um, the new narrative in a way that speaks to the truth. Um, there's a wonderful biography by Jason Riley of Tom Sowell and he starts out by saying uh, what Dr. Soule says is if you want to help people, you tell them the truth. And I very much subscribe to that idea. All right. And uh, Dr. Riley would love to hear your thoughts. And also, you know, being a, a, a college professor, so you're, you're interacting with, with uh, kids all the time who may not be hearing this kind of uh, dialogue or point of view, what compelled you to join 1776 Unites? And why is it particularly important for young people to know that even something like this exists? Well, I, I think that's a great question. What compelled me to join 1776 Unites other than, you know, the charisma, the personality of Bob, which everyone's described, we're almost all personal friends with Bob Woodson. But the, the primary motivator for me was the idea that the other major ideology that's sort of contending here is simply wrong in a way that's empirically provable and that's harmful to Black kids. So if you listen to, for example, the 1619 School of History, I guess you could call it political science to some extent, it's almost invariably just doomsaying. So the idea is that American history has been an endless pattern of oppression with us as African-Americans doing nothing effective to respond to it. And that this is, if anything, getting worse today. It's more hidden, it's more subtle. Uh, there's a book out right now that's in the top thousand or so on Amazon called Legalized Genocide or Open Season, The Legalized Genocide of Colored People by a prominent attorney. And many, many people believe this is going on, that living in America as an upper middle class black person in 2021 is a sort of unending nightmare. And I, I think that this narrative is ridiculous, for want of a better word, even in the past, there was strong, proud black resilience against real oppression. Um, if you look at the free black regiments that fought in the Civil War, some of the things that happened under Reconstruction, the civil rights movement itself, who spearheaded that. But today, the claim that the United States is a terrible place in which to exist or which to be a person of color is simply not true. Uh, I think that one of the great hidden stories in society today is that minorities are actually doing fairly well. Um, the African-American personal income, obviously strengthening households is a priority for us and for all other groups in this country, but is around 80% of that for whites before you adjust for things like age and region. Asian-Americans who also have a long history of oppression here out earn whites, uh, outperform both whites and blacks on most educational metrics. And I think both you and I'll get back to that during this conversation. But uh, going on with this, if you look at the top 10 uh, income earning groups in the USA, Virtually none of them are Caucasian. Indian Americans are currently in the number one spot. 
Filipino Americans, Taiwanese Americans. There's generally a very heavily black group on that list, South Africans or Nigerians. And what you find if you unpack why people are successful, why this multicolored band of countrymen is doing so well, is that three or four things, how you perform on aptitude tests, is there a father in the home, where you choose to live, are you, are you moving to seek work? That's what predicts what you're earning and how you're doing in life. So I don't, I don't think any fair-minded person, I mean, the judge said eloquently, obviously slavery was a great wound, a deep cut in this country. I don't think anyone would deny that, for example, more black people or even quote unquote POC, a, a term I dislike, but are, are poor today because of past history or past oppression. No one, no one denies that. But the goal there, if we know what the path to success is, is to promote to black kids, to African-Americans, and for that matter, to everyone else, the things that actually make you successful in life, hitting the books in school, keeping your family stable, so on down the line. And to me, this ghost hunting for imaginary forms of racism, the white gaze and so on, is a distraction from that. And it's a negative distraction. The more time my kids put into protesting in a city that's largely and often successfully integrated, the less time they are doing those things that will produce those positive results. Uh, and a quick final sentence here. You, you asked as a college professor, you know, how do you, how do you engage with the kids? How do you communicate these ideas to them? Uh, I, en I enjoy where I teach. Um, I lean right, but I'm, I'm pro-Black. I see no disconnect whatsoever between those two things. And I don't think Martin Luther King or Booker T. Washington would have either. But so I get along well with the kids. I, I play ball on campus. I think I'm a, po a popular professor. But I will say, when I bring absolutely mainstream center-right resources like Thomas Sowell, for that matter, like the men I just mentioned into the classroom, one of the things that's shocking is that kids will very often tell me, this is the first time I've heard this half of the story. Um, for years, it's been Howard Zinn, Nicole Hannah-Jones, Ibram Kendi. And you're telling me that there are these people, Jason Riley, Coleman Hughes, Ian Rowe on one or two occasions that have opened, uh, openly offered to debate these people and have written major op-eds and best-selling books that I've never heard about them. Why have I never heard about them? And when you begin to answer that question, you start telling the other side of the story. Excellent. Well, you know, it's just, just so interesting. All three of you talk about not only the sort of reframing of history in America as this land of oppression, but there's this almost determined effort to make this connection to present day that black people essentially are powerless. And you know, we've, we've mentioned Nicole Hannah-Jones a couple of times. She wrote a, a, an 8,000 word piece in the New York Times Magazine, I think it was last year, where she was making her case for that the only way that Amer black Americans could succeed was if the government uh, deployed a tri multiple trillion dollar reparations program. And in this essay, she says, quote, none of the actions we are told black people must take if they want to lift themselves out of poverty and gain financial stability. And this is what she said, not marrying, not getting educated, not saving more, not owning a home. None of that can mitigate 400 years of racialized plundering, end quote. So just think about that for a second. She says literally none of these actions. So if you were a college professor, Dr. Lowry, and, and ironically, by the way, I believe Nicole Hannah-Jones has done each one of those things in her own life <laughs> and, and probably is achieving prosperity as a result. But when you hear something like that, it's almost like they're, there's a, they're on a mission to convince young black kids and, and maybe kids of all races, I don't know, but young black kids in particular that they're powerless to overcome. Like, how do you respond to that? Well, I respond by doing what Will Riley suggests we do, which is to look at what the facts are. I mean, I know where that comes from. It comes from people like William Darity, the economist at Duke, who touts the racial wealth gap and who has papers out there saying that the racial wealth gap, racial wealth gap, this is the disparity at the median between the net worth of black and white households won't be affected if you control for, and then there's a long list of things, household composition, work history, and, uh, financial literacy, et cetera, et cetera. This kind of talk is belied by the facts. It's belied by the facts of immigrants who come and who advance up the ladder very rapidly through in uh, entrepreneurship and uh, human capital acquisition and whatnot. 
Uh, it's belied by the success sequence that you're always talking about, Ro, uh, Ian, where uh, you observe that if people complete school, uh, get a job, marry, and then have kids, they're almost zero probability that they're going to be poor if they do those things in that order. Um, it's belied by the uh, dynamics of uh, the income disparity of African Americans, which as again, uh, Will has pointed out, uh, shows that uh, personal income to uh, uh, black people, men and women, uh, relative to whites has uh, improved uh, considerably over the last uh, half century. Um, and it also offends common sense, doesn't it? Hard work won't do anything for you. Starting a business is a, is a road to nowhere. Saving your money and investing in your kids' education is a, is a waste of your time. There's nothing that can be done until white people hand over reparations to black people for plunder. And don't get me started on the false narrative of plunder, as if this great country, this $20 trillion economy, this massive engine of economic dynamism was built solely and primarily on the backs of the uh, stolen labor of slaves. Of course, slave labor contributed to it. So did the massive immigration flow from Europe. So did the building of transcontinental railroads. So did the accumulation of massive uh, capital investments that permitted industrial growth and development. So it is an elaborate wine being offered as an excuse to avoid the existential necessity in life of getting busy. That's the only way that black people are going to advance. We need to get busy. That's hard work. Some people don't want to do it. Wow. Well, Judge Brown, I mean, what's again, it's so fascinating because again, you know, what is it like someone like Nicole Hannah-Jones or other successful black people who represent this kind of ideology, it seems like they're actually working hard in their own lives, right? It seems like they're actually embracing the ideals of strong families, free enterprise, hard work, education, and yet somehow they do not want to preach what they are practicing in their own lives. What do you think that motivation is to almost hide hide things like the success sequence or the data that Dr. Riley outlined. What, what is that motivation, do you think? I am not sure what the motivation may be. I'm always astonished and dismayed um, to hear this message of futility and ceaseless victimization coming from people um, who are themselves an example of how to succeed. Um, almost every one of the people that's delivering that message to our children are people who are phenomenally successful in their own right. And as you have said, uh, are doing all of the things that they tell people won't make any difference. Uh, that's an incredible contradiction in terms. I'm old enough to uh, have been around, born in the South during uh, the era of de jure segregation. Uh, when uh, things were much more difficult than they are now. And I never, ever received that message from my family, my parents, my grandparents, anyone in our neighborhood. Uh, they would never have said, uh, just give up. You can't make it. Um, there is no way for you to, to win. Um, in fact, they would say, okay, uh, life may not be fair. That's not an excuse. You are still required um, to do your best to achieve excellence, to be the best that you can be. Um, and so I don't, I'm not, I wish I understood the motivation uh, of people who want um, a whole group of people to feel powerless. Uh, and feckless and to feel that their situation is hopeless. I really don't understand that. The only thing I can speculate um, is that there has to be something in it for people or they would not be inclined to say these kinds of things. There is no, um, there is no logic to it. Um, the, their own lives disprove it. So why would they say it unless it benefits them in some way? But that message um, was not the message that we received in a time when things, it was much more difficult to achieve what they are achieving. 
Uh, we're we're going to go to questions pretty soon. But Dr. Riley, I'd love to get your thought on this question too, because if if some of your college students heard that quote from uh, Nicole Hannah Jones, is there do you think kind of almost like a pressure on campus to comply with these ideas because because expressing sort of a disconnect or expressing a disbelief might get that person ostracized in some way. Are you feeling that that's a, a pressure point for, for college students, on, at least on your campus? Sure, I, I think it is on most uh, campuses. As we all know, young people tend to lean left in the first place. I mean, if you're talking about the African-American community, Nicole Hannah-Jones ideas are based around the idea that money in essence should be delivered in bulk to the black population. So that's that's tempting to not a few younger African-Americans. I think if you're a popular white kid on the KSU campus, you might keep some of your reservations about this very, very close to the vest. Um, I mean, I, I think that the, the first two commenters have already summed up the issues with this pretty well. But I mean, just very briefly, obviously, NHJ's claim is wrong on a couple of levels. I mean, first of all, when you talk about the racial wealth gap, Glenn might correct me here, but something like half of that gap vanishes if you remove billionaires from the equation. A great deal of that is due to the consolidation of wealth at the extreme upper end in our society, which is a very different problem, if it's a problem at all, that has almost nothing to do with race. And now at a tougher level, if you remove those billionaires from the equation and you adjust for the income people make, and you still find that black people are saving whatever it is, 30% less than whites and so have less wealth, we have to do what's almost taboo in modern social science and criticize black people to some extent for that. I mean, there are financial decisions that we as a community have to make that again are very simple, that lead to success. A lot of the sort of cliched things everyone's preacher and coach said at age 16 turn out to be true <laughs> in the empirical literature. Um, a, a final comment. So when Nicole Hannah-Jones says, without this move being made by society as a whole, we have no chance marriage, getting a good job, so on, cannot close this gap. I think, as you said, that she herself has to know at some level that's a false statement. I mean, when you look at the history of immigration to the United States, one of the great things about this country is that many of the groups to come here began in a penniless state. I mean, when you look at Vietnamese immigrants to the United States, those were largely the boat people. Those were the Han Chinese population of South Vietnam that attempted to escape the country after the war. And many of them through luck, hard work got here. I mean, that's now one of the most successful populations in the country. And you can say the same thing about immigrants from say, Northern Ireland, Bosnia, so on down the line. I mean, people who came here with basically a pair of shoes without at all mocking their situation. So for us to say, and this I think is important for us to say that the same things that made a Bosnian Muslim immigrant after a tough war that involved our own country successful could not make a black person successful. That idea involves a remarkable amount of hidden contempt for African Americans. And I think that this is kind of the secret of a lot of this content on the American left. There's far too much comfort with the idea of black people as sort of the slow kids of the country. The things that work for other groups just won't work for them. So we can't attempt to apply those processes to them. And instead we need this special giveaway that has never previously been done. I don't think that's true. I, I advance here the bold position that black people have just as much potential as everyone else. So I, yeah, I like the rest of the panel reject that statement. Of course, there is some temptation to agree with that on a, on a modern collegiate campus. Yeah, especially a black one. Well, we are starting to get questions uh, from our audience and not surprisingly, they are looking for solutions. So, you know, one student uh, from Brandeis, who's a social policy graduate student is asking, you know, how do you get this other side of the story? You know, Dr. Riley, that you were saying, like, you know, is it is it curricula? You know, is it anti-racist curricula? You know, I'll make one plug. Uh, for 1776 Unites, uh, you know, again, Bob Woodson had this great vision, not just for us to have a point of view or, you know, write essays, which was important to present uh, a sort of a counterpoint to the dominant narrative. He said, let's actually create curricula that we can have distributed in schools across the country. And that is what we've now done. And I'm, I'm very pleased to say we just crossed 
uh, 20,000 downloads of this uh, 1776 Unites curricula in uh, private schools, public charter schools, traditional district schools, after schools, home schools, prison ministries um, that tell, in our view, a more complete uh, story of the African-American experience. To your point earlier, Judge Brown, warts and all. So it's not just a, a unit on the Tulsa massacre, it's also on what were the conditions that led to all the black entrepreneurship leading up to the Tulsa massacre, as well as what was the rebuilding effort afterwards. Tell the entire story. So this idea of curricula seems to be a powerful one and certainly one that um, we're practicing at 1776 Unites. But how could this kind of content, you know, especially for Dr. Lowry and, and Dr. Riley, you know, because you're on college campuses, because it seems that most of the professorial leadership does not necessarily look kindly on this kind of content being taught. So where would the average college student get exposure to these kinds of ideas? Um, I can go first, I guess. If, yeah, go yeah. ahead, Will. All right. So I, I think there are two different levels here. First of all, over the past four or five years, as you've seen, quote unquote, the great awakening in society, to quote Zach Goldberg, you have seen a very coherent response from normal citizens to this. So, I mean, there are a great number of groups. Uh, 1776 Unites has gotten a great response from my students and I think from America as a whole. I'm also a member of a group, as I think Glenn is, a group called FAIR, the Foundation Against Intolerance and Racism. I am. Which, yeah, which takes the bold position of opposing both traditional racism from often the right and sort of new progressive neo-racism. I, I don't really think there's any shortage of content in the books of Tom Sowell, so on down the line, that presents this sort of alternative perspective on the country or on black history. And I will note that until pretty recently, perhaps the mid 1990s, the idea that America was flawed but great was the mainstream perspective. I mean, what we've, what we've seen change since that point hasn't really been the facts known to science. It's been the predominant narrative in the media and academia. But I, I do think that gets to kind of the deeper problem, which is the composition of the media and academia uh, to some extent. I mean, when you look at the collegiate campus, the, the most recent figures I remember from Econ Live were about 93 to seven uh, liberals and left-leaning moderates to conservatives and libertarians among the professoriate. That's almost identical to the breakdown in the media, which goes back to Pew 2004, and then their redo of that survey. So the, the real question is, what do you do when almost everyone in an institution favors one of two, to some extent, equal perspectives that have been feuding for decades? If you have that 93 to 7% bias, I mean, I certainly think people like myself, Glenn, Ian, the judge and public appearances, so on, can, can present the other side of what I believe reality to be. Changing the institutions is a tougher one. I mean, we saw Peter Bogosian retire yesterday and go into private business consulting. So I, I think right now, there's a tendency on the part of a lot of highly intelligent heterodox people to set up alternative institutions I strongly support that, love the major think tanks. I mean, obviously we're working with AEI here. Uh, I do think that we also do need to be working with grad students and so on to try to get people back into those mainstream institutions to, for want of a better word, integrate them. Doing that is a tough fight though. Uh, keep producing content, keep sharing what you know to be true. Just data itself is extremely powerful. The, uh, the 90 to 10 slant is uh, difficult to overcome for right now, but I have hope for the future. Yeah, I can't add much to that. That that's a very effective statement from Wilfred Riley. Yeah. Um, another question: How can African American students from poorer socioeconomic areas empower themselves to become more successful if they often lack hands-on support in their home, or if they face negative peer pressure? And Judge Brown, I'd love to get your perspective. I think sometimes the left or people who are, who are more progressive accuse um, those on the right or more conservative of saying, well, you should just lift yourself up by the bootstraps. You know, if you're poor, it doesn't matter. You should just, you should just be able to do that. And it, it seems like that's, that is a fair criticism if that's what was being said. So what would you say to this, this, this uh, student who's asking this question about if you are, you know, if you are born in circumstances 
in a single parent household or, or uh, lacking resources? Well, I had the great good fortune of being uh, born into uh, a family um, that uh, was uh, all about, um, you know, helping me, uh, promoting um, an interest in education, in reading, in learning in every way that I possibly could. Um, but I recognize that not everybody has that. Um, but if you don't, you still have um, the library, you still have the ability, uh, you know, to educate yourself, to find uh, resources. And you don't, um, you know, one thing I always think of is I have been mentored uh, by some of the greatest minds in the world. I found them in the library, in books. <laughs> so that, that is always an option for you. It's one that... Um, is available to you, uh, you know, even, even when you have nothing. Um, it's also the case that there will always be teachers. Um, you know, I started out in a school that had almost nothing. I was born in Alabama. Uh, it was a very poor school system for everyone. For Black people, it was even worse. Um, but the thing about that was that the teachers there uh, who couldn't teach in other places. Many of them had advanced degrees, uh, but they absolutely uh, gave no quarter. We were supposed to learn. We were going to do uh, the best. Um, they were interested in excellence, not excuses. So they um, lit from their own personal libraries, their own books. Um, and so I think that you will always find people if you look for them who are interested um, in helping you, who will help you find resources, who will um, share their knowledge with you. Um, so that might be a way to start. Um, and you only need one person like that to get you going. Yep. It seems that a lot of the um, underlying tension in this whole argument is sort of competing um, theories of causality. Right, so one of our um, students asked the question, you know, they're going back to James Q. Wilson's argument that, you know, family structure breakdown of the family is a problem, but that the cause of lower black marriage rates and high single motherhood rates are the result of a lack of jobs. So it's jobs that's the problem, not necessarily a cultural factor. And then this person says, you know, I, I don't buy that theory. I think Charles Murray's arguments are more convincing but I'm given pause by poor behavior that this person has observed among upper class teens and college students. So I'm just curious how much of this actually is born out genuine disagreement about causality. And maybe that's what um, is driving this tension because we can't even agree on what are the real factors holding the black community back. I mean, Glenn, I know you've done a, a, a lot of research uh, in this area. <laughs> Uh, I actually want to respond to the previous question, if I can, Ian, yep. which is what can you do? And I mean, I think there's some very practical things you can do. You can have a realistic plan about what you're trying to achieve in your life starting at 16, 17, 18 years old. Community college is not a bad thing. It's a good thing. Vocational education is not a bad thing. It can be a very good thing. You should use your time effectively. I mean, realizing that there's, you only come in this way once in the years between 18 and 22, when people are ordinarily in college is, are absolutely critical to development. I think the success sequence is good advice to people. You should choose your associates wisely. The people you hang with will have a big impact on how you think and what you do. Don't waste your time with people who are not going anywhere. I know that sounds like an old man giving a kid an advice, but I, it's actually, pretty good advice at, at the end of the day. So, I mean, I, I think there must be an elaborate success sequence, you know, uh, a series of observations about things, practical things that people can do. Have a plan, have a concrete vision in your head about how you put one foot in front of the other. Don't mess around with people who are not going anywhere. That's a choice you get to make about whom you associate with. Uh, and don't waste your time. Uh, before I give uh, uh, folks a definition of the success sequence, if, they don't, if they're not familiar with it, one thing we don't often talk about, Glenn, is faith. Where would you put faith in that, that litany of, of recommendations that you just made? Well, this is personal, right? It's uh, religious, and not everybody is going to subscribe to any particular thing that you say here. It can be a very powerful anchor and centering, and 
a person's life. Not only the institutional resources and support that you get from affiliating with uh, a congregation, a church community or whatever, but from the internal resources that one gets of discipline and self-command and self-understanding of modesty and uh, humility and perseverance and uh, a, an ability to stay hopeful despite the vicissitudes that will visit us. So, you know, I mean, I don't want to tell anybody what to believe. I can only give the testimony that I was saved by my encounter with Jesus Christ. Wow. Uh, for those who are not familiar with this terminology called the success sequence, it's essentially a label of uh, assigned to a series of decisions that are typically made in your younger part of your life, you know, 24 and above, 24 and below, that if you finish your education, even just a high school degree, then a full-time job of any kind, just so you learn the dignity and discipline of work. And then if you have children, marriage first, that series of decisions amongst millennials, 97% of the people who followed that series of decisions in that order have avoided poverty. And something like 70 plus percent are in the middle class or above. And so it's pretty overwhelming. Uh, and then amongst the black community, it's about 91% uh, who follow those same series of decisions. In fact, a few years ago, there was a study done about black men. You know, the narrative about black men, we're an endangered species. But you know, to, to, to Dr. Riley's point, some of that data is, is um, you know, that narrative is overblown. But there was a study done about uh, black men making it in America. And the data showed that for those black men who were following the success sequence, and in addition, there were a couple other elements. One was having a faith commitment, two was sometimes military involvement, but this idea of a sense of personal agency, meaning that they felt they had some control over their own destiny. Those factors played significantly into the life prospects of these black men. And I think these are the kinds of data stories, Dr. Riley, that we, I think all of us are desperately trying to, to get out there to college students and beyond. So um, anti-racist curriculum, sounds good. That should be the answer, right? And who, who could be against anti-racist curriculum? So we've gotten a couple questions from saying, is, isn't that the answer? And so, Will, I know you've talked about anti-race. So anti-racist on its label sounds good, but what is anti-racist curricula in practice based on your experience? Yeah, I mean, that, that's a genuinely, or generally uh, neo-racist curricula would be my answer. But before, before unpacking that a little bit, a uh, quick comment on the James Q. Wilson point. Uh, I, I haven't done this myself, but it seems empirically like it wouldn't be very difficult to track something like out of wedlock birth rates against the unemployment rate, for example, or the black unemployment rate. Uh, my understanding is that declining industrial employment, which hit whites as hard as blacks, if you look at Allentown and so on, but did correlate with a jump in divorces specifically. But then in general, we've seen a pretty consistent unemployment joblessness, blue collar joblessness, et cetera, rate in the USA since uh, someone might correct me, but the late 1970s. And at that same time, we've seen, you know, fatherlessness increase in the black community from 29% to 72%. So I, I think there's often a desire to almost make excuses here to some extent to say, well, one of the many variables in the multivariate model, one of the more sympathetic ones perhaps must explain all of this. No, I mean, you're looking at it, you're looking at a broad set of things interacting, but no, just the, the unemployment, it's not harder to get a job now as a black man than it was in 1950. Um, getting back to the point about uh, anti-racist curricula, Anti-racism in the Ibram Kendi sense is something that's very important actually for people on kind of the, our side of this debate, heterodox, center right, 1776, whatever you wanna call it, to understand. So the definition of racist in the writings of Dr. Kendi or Robin D'Angelo or Bell Hooks is essentially any system that produces any disparity in outcomes that's statistically significant among racial groups is racist because the only two possible explanations for that would be one, genetic inferiority, which no one on either side wants to claim, or two, some kind of hidden, subtle bias 
deep within the SAT or the system of policing or whatever. The reality, of course, is that's nonsense. We've talked about some of the intervening things here, you know, age, marriage, region, crime rates are generally higher in the South, so on. But that, that is the point. That's the, that's the argument that any system that doesn't produce perfect equality is racist. So anti-racist curricula tend to be based around three ideas. The first is the Richard Delgado idea that, quote unquote, racism is every day. The USA is an institutionally unfixably racist nation. Two, um, the evidence of this unfixable racism is these disparities. There are very few tests where everyone finishes equally. Uh, and three, the solution is equity. So whenever you hear about something like an equity curriculum, equity in practice, coming even from that legal background, means proportional representation or close. It's the idea that you achieve equality when they're the exact proportional number of Blacks, women, et cetera, in every field. So most of the anti-racist curricula I have personally reviewed as a college professor or executive include most of the things that we've been critiquing here on the panel today. So there, there are some exceptions, Chloe Valdry's theory of enchantment and so on, but I would prefer to go back to fact-based curricula, non-racist curricula to some extent. I think anti-racism means a certain thing in modern political life. Yep. Well, amazingly, we are almost near the end of our session, uh, unbelievably. I want to make sure I leave um, uh, a minute for each one of you to just give a, uh, a parting statement. Um, and, I, and I think I'd love for you to just focus on, you know, what should be the message to our college students today in terms of, you know, again, making sense of this world that they want to inherit and how they as young Americans or or, or kids from around the world, they should improve things. What's, what, what is it about the founding principles of the United States of America that they should hold on to that are worthy of defense, as you said, uh, Judge Brown, that are, that are worthy of investing, that are worthy in defending, and that are worthy of adopting in their own personal lives? Like, what would you say, and, I, and Judge Brown, I'll, I'll, I'll start with you if, if, if you can, you know, there are a lot of kids who um, who are inherently optimistic, but are hearing an, a narrative that is very pessimistic and aren't sure what tools they have at their own avail. What would you say that they have still have the power to achieve? Well, I would still say uh, what I was taught, which is uh, that you can do anything you want to do if you are willing to work hard enough um, to achieve it. Um, and that um, that is part of what's wonderful about America. Uh, I know this is considered a microaggression now, but this really is a land of opportunity. You really can control your destiny. Uh, you really can achieve the things um, that you want to achieve. Um, I think America brought something uh, amazing into the world. Uh, it's the first regime that is really focused on um, self-government. Um, it's based on an idea, uh, all men are created equal um, in the sense that no one is uh, born to rule, no one is born to be a slave. The only just government is a government um, that operates with your consent um, so that you are controlling uh, what happens to you. At least that's the idea. And these principles uh, freedom of conscience, freedom of speech, um, protection of property, uh, that people should uh, are entitled to the protection of what they have earned and what they own. Those are principles that I think deserve allegiance and devotion and not derision. And so I hope that um, what students take with them is to have the courage to explore that, not to let somebody else tell you what your country is about, or what the declaration means, but to read those things for yourself, um, to study what the founders were talking about, uh, why that's what leads to freedom, and make your own decision. Don't have this uh, fed to you, and always pursue the truth um, and have courage. Have courage. Wow. Well, Dr. Lowry, um, your uh, final parting thought? I have a dream that one day my children and all of our children will live in a country where they're going to be judged by the content of their character and not the color of their skin. You know, somebody said that we are not our race. 
It's only one feature of our humanity. It's not the most important thing about us. In fact, it's not a very important thing. Um, we're one people here in the United States of America. We are one people, Americans. Barack Obama said it. I only wish that while president, he had practiced more of what he preached in that respect. We're one people here. Our problems will not be resolved at the United Nations. There is no cosmic court of justice. We have to get together with our fellow Americans around the table and figure out how we're going to live together. And I don't care what the issue is, if it's wealth, if it's health, uh, if it's war and peace, we got to solve these problems together. All right, Dr. Riley. Yeah, well, it's, it's kind of hard to follow the uh, opening lines of Lynn's final piece there. Um, but basically, if, if I were giving one piece of advice to those listening, especially to younger people, it's just remember that for all of these debates in the background about things like racism, what role past history plays on your life? Does that affect where you live? What role minor contemporary prejudice plays in your life? Any, anything else perhaps from the, the fringe wing of the right? The, 90% of what you do in your life is going to be up to you. I mean, you just read the items off of the success sequence and they are incredibly simple. Complete your high school education. Go on and take a job, any job, and apply for better jobs while you work that. Wait until you are married, or as a not particularly religious man, I will note, past age 25, to have children, and, and so on down the line. These are the things that determine, to a large extent, whether you're going to have a poor or a working class life on the one hand, or a happy upper middle class life on the other hand. So as you listen to these debates from figures including ourselves, and as you develop your opinions about the level of prejudice in the country and so on, don't forget that the main thing that predicts who you're going to be in life is what you do for yourself every day, and most of that is not incredibly difficult. That is the key piece of advice I would give to a young man or young woman any human being outstanding well let me let me just close by saying uh you know de tocqueville when he did his observation of america he wrote uh quote the greatness of america lies not in being more enlightened than any other nation but rather in her ability to repair her faults end quote i always find that just an incredibly compelling statements because it just suggests that with the, within our founding documents, within our founding principles, within the constitution, the Declaration of Independence, the, um, all the amendments is that the tools of self-betterment, the tools of self-renewal that exist within those founding principles and documents also exists within each one of us. And I think that's what you're talking about, Dr. Riley, that you have power when people are telling you that you are powerless, you have to reject that ideology. And I think you're hearing from some pretty amazing people that you have the ability to determine your own destiny. And that is you know, part of the inspiration. That doesn't mean pull yourself up by the bootstraps. There are lots of institutions that can help you get there. Um, but you can make what you want out of this precious life that you have. So with that, thank you very much for an amazing panel, Judge Brown. Dr. Lowry, Dr. Riley, thank you all. This was really incredible.